Please remain standing for the reading of the gospel. From the gospel of St. Matthew, chapter 25, verses 1 through 10. We will also be doing the text from Exodus from from your bulletin, but we're also going to be doing Matthew. Then the kingdom of heaven will be like this. Whenever you read scripture and it says the kingdom of heaven will be like this, it means this is God's intent, not only for heaven, but the kingdom of heaven, which also exists here on earth. This is God's vision for creation. The kingdom of heaven will be like this. Ten young women took their lamps and went to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish and five were wise. When the foolish took their lamps, they took no oil with them. But the wise took flasks of oil with their lamps. As the bridegroom was delayed, all of them became drowsy and slept. But at midnight there was a shout, Look, here is the bridegroom. Come out to meet him. Then all those young women got up and trimmed their lamps. The foolish said to the wise, give us some of your oil for our lamps are going out. But the wise replied, no, there will not be enough for you and for us. You had better go to the dealers and buy some for yourselves. And while they went to buy it, the bridegroom came and those who were ready went with him into the wedding banquet and the door was shut. Later, the other young women came also saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he replied, truly, I tell you, I do not know you. Keep awake, therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour. These are the words of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. Please be seated. A little bit of personal privilege, if you don't mind. Over the last 25 to 30 years, Smyrna First has bought four pieces of property. Did I get that right, David? David? Over, about, over the last 25 to 30 years, Smyrna has bought four pieces of property around the building, contiguous property, and you have had four separate senior pastors in the purchase of that property. That is a great message. That is a great sign of strength and help for this congregation that as this person changes, you stay healthy and vital and future fo- fo- focused. And I want you to know your reputation, not only amongst us, the clergy who are here, active and retired, but your reputation amongst the conference is strong as a church focused on keeping the main thing, the main thing, and moving forward. And I want to say, well done. Thank you for that. Well done on on your behalf and well done on your work and grateful for you. Along with that, I want to remind you that Bishop Dees will be here Wednesday night at the Wednesday night supper. She'll be here to say, well done. She'll be here to say, congratulations. We'll walk her through everything that's happening and see all the vitality that's here, and she'll get a chance to see what's going on here. What God is doing here is special. What God is doing here is not the experience of most United Methodists around us. And what God is doing here, we want others to be able to see and to get hope. And so she's going to come and experience it here and then be able to go to other places and offer that hope as well. Amen? So if you get a chance to say or say thank you for uh, allowing us to keep the Tillman proceeds, thank you for being a part of that, thank you for supporting us with that, uh, and helping us to continue these ministries, and obviously, um, thank you for her ministry. This sermon series is, is about developing a, a roadmap for purpose and peace. This sermon series, as as I put it together, as I began to dig into it, was knowing that this would be a stressful season. Amen? And wanting to let this place be a, a place of peace where you could come and the rest of the world be squeezed out and you could come and and hear from God. And as we began to work through it and began to process through it, these truths, these spiritual practices and spiritual truths that began to to walk in, and because of some timing and also the bridegrooms and Shane's wedding next weekend, that kind of resonated for me right now, I realized when I walk in Sabbath into this type A congregation of overachievers, of Sabbath into folks who already are sitting here doing their list for next week, I'm not going to give you any peace today. Some of you are going to hate this sermon, and that's all right. But what I hope you hear, what I hope you hear is your week doesn't have to be jacked up next week. 
Amen? Your week doesn't have to be crazy. The truth of the matter is we make choices and that God has given us a plan. God has given us an order that allows us to walk into a week confident, to walk into a month at ease. However, we have to listen. Sabbath allows us to say yes to God and no to God's rivals. Sabbath allows us to listen to what it is that God has for us and speak to us so that we can say yes to God and no to God's rivals. So the immediate question there is, what are God's rivals? What is it that are God's rivals? Anything that takes our attention and focus away from God is a rival of God. Amen? I sense your enthusiasm. So let's go into that Exodus text, chapter 20, verses 8 through 11. Remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work. But the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. You shall not do any work, you, your son, or your daughter, your male or female slave, your livestock, or the alien resident in your towns. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that is in them, but rested the seventh day. Therefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and consecrated it, the word of God for the people of God. There is no fully saying yes to God without saying no to God's rivals. And one of the ways that we do that is the ancient practice of solitude. In the fourth century, there were monastics who felt that the church had become too institutionalized. Let me say that again. In the fourth century, there were monastics who felt like the church had become too institutionalized. It's not a new discussion, brothers and sisters. It's not a new issue. The question, the helpful thing is to look at it when it has been a feeling, what did they do? So they went out and they practiced solitude, these monastics, as a way to move the noise out of their lives. And it was based on this simple premise. I am going to say no to these habits so that I can say yes to godly habits. Solitude was a fast from people. The introverts in this room are going, I don't know what's wrong with this sermon so far. I'm liking it a great deal right now. Solitude is about a, a, a fast from people, from all social interaction as a way to clear your heart, mind, and soul. Sabbath is not a way to do nothing. Sabbath is not intended and purposed for us to go play ball. It's not intended and purposed for us as a way to take it off. Sabbath, as the way that God designed it and built it, is a way for us to stop what we're doing so that we can hear from God. All spiritual practices are intended to take the focus off of us and place the focus on God. As I'm approaching the end of my 24th year in ministry, I have learned that occasional solitude is essential. For just a second, I won't, I won't take you here too long, but for just a second, picture, picture yourself not speaking for the next 24 hours to anyone. But along with that, picture yourself also not hearing anyone speak for the next 24 hours hours. But having the freedom, having the ability to hear and to listen only from God, fasting from social engagement, quieting your heart, mind, and soul, the spiritual practice of saying no is essential in prioritizing when and where to say yes. When we do this, we take the focus off of ourselves and place it on God. The purpose is to find out not what we want, not what I want, but what God wants. When we don't give ourselves to these practices, we create a new unholy trinity. The unholy trinity of me, myself, and I. We will let God in some, but you got to live on our terms, God. We'll let you in a little bit. We'll let you come in a little bit, but, you know, God, you got to fit into my schedule, fit into all the things that I have going on. 
He can come into our turf, into our sanctuary, into our world, but make sure our opinions and ideas are driving the discussions. And what Sabbath does, it allows us to stop and to say, which ones of these are mine from me, and which ones are these God's from God? There is no saying yes to God without saying no to God's rivals. The literal translation of Sabbath is Shabbat, And Shabbat mostly is understood, Sabbath is mostly understood as the word rest. It's what you've heard your whole lives. Sabbath means rest. But to go back to the closest translation, it doesn't mean rest, it means stop. Shabbat is to stop. And Shabbat is not the stop of time. It exists in time. Shabbat exists in time. And so that time continues, but while you're in Shabbat, you have stopped what you're doing and turned solely to God. You have stopped your activity, you have stopped your actions, you have stopped your personal thinking, and you have turned to what is it that God is saying to me. Notice what God says about the first six days in creation. Do you remember? When he was asked to describe, when God described those first six days, what did he call those first six days? Good. He looked at people, and he looked at the mountains, and he looked at the water, and he looked at the stars, and he said, each day is good. But the seventh day is not good, is it? The seventh day he consecrated, which means it's not good, it's holy. Sabbath, Shabbat, is the first part of creation that is consecrated and made holy. Not as a good idea, but as essential to our lives, essential to ordering, essential to scheduling, essential to living our lives is this concept of stopping, of stopping and listening to God and having that holy consecrated day come into our lives. When we live in the economy of the world, we are petrified by scarcity. When we live in the economy of a schedule driven by the world, we are petrified and exhausted by the scarcity of time. But when we live in the economy of the holy, we are constantly amazed at the abundance. And if you heard yourself this morning when I asked about your jacked up week resonating, take me at my word here. And if you will practice Shabbat, stopping, you will be amazed at the doors and the times that God will open for you and your spirit and your heart and your soul and your schedule. When you practice Sabbath, you learn it is not the day that is holy, it is the non-use of time for the world, for yourself, and giving that time to God that is holy. Sports, I love sports, so you just... Humor me just for a second. It is a John Wooden quote that I love. Don't mistake activity for achievement. To produce results, tasks must be well organized and properly executed. Otherwise, it's no different from children running around the playground. Everybody is doing something, but nothing is being done. Lots of activity, no achievement. Okay, you type A's that I'm still sitting here with. I'm not going to talk you into taking a day off. Can I talk you into being more productive? That Shabbat, Sabbath, is built for us to live more productive, God-filled, God-fueled, God-inspired lives. God is pleased today that we have no debt. Amen? You know there's a line coming, right? But God was thrilled two years ago when we were broke and you said we're going to hire two children's directors to go invest in our children's ministry to make sure we're gathering children. That's when God's heart sang. God's heart sang when Ben and Scott stood in this room two years ago when we were broke and didn't know how we were going to keep paying the bills, and they said our metrics are baptisms and people who give their life to Jesus Christ in the middle of this room, and that room, and this room earlier in the morning. When people are giving their lives to Jesus Christ, that's going to be the metric, and that's vision. That's looking for the sacred and the holy and God continuing to guide and to lead and pleasing to God. Activity without accomplishment, without achievement, is wasted activity. If you will give yourself to Shabbat, to Sabbath, to stopping, 
you will also find yourself more productive and more inspired. Jesus took this very seriously. This was something that Jesus was very fired up about. How do I know it? Because when he was teaching a parable and he explained and said, the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven will be like this. He talked about those who prepared and those who did not prepare. I've always heard this sermon preached. Clergy, I've always heard this sermon preached about the, what happens when you die, whether you go to heaven or hell, and accepting Jesus. That's not what this is. You know how I know that? Because I got a wedding next week. And you know who that wedding is? It's one of my boys. Do you know Jesus' first miracle, where that was? At a wedding. Do you know how stressful weddings are? Do you know how much angst and anxiety are fed into weddings? Jesus went to his wedding and his mother put his finger in his face and said, go do what I tell you, boy. These folks are stressed out. Weddings will wear you out and scare you to death. So Jesus is teaching these people and saying, you know what it's like to be at a wedding and people aren't ready. And see, wedding culture is different in those days than it was today. When they had a wedding, it'd be around 10 in the morning. And then what they would do is they would go to house to house of all their friends in the community. And the houses that they would go to were to the houses of the people not invited to the party that night at the groom's home. So they would literally go from home to home to home to home to check in with people and to see people and to say thank you to people of the folks that weren't invited to the party. Look, we know we didn't invite you to the party, but we still love you. Please don't be mad at us. It was that tour. Sounds fun on your wedding day, right? But can you imagine you actually get invited to the party? Can you imagine you get invited to the wedding party that night and you don't show up with what is required of you? You don't show up, you didn't care enough, you didn't prepare enough to honor the bride and groom that day. You didn't pre prepare enough to care about the family and all the sacrifice and all the work, and you didn't care enough to make sure there was oil in that lamp. Did you hear what Jesus called them? Foolish. I don't know about you, but I don't want to be called foolish. And those who did take the time to prepare were wise. Jesus is very clear on this. Take the time to prepare. See the stress that is around you. See the stress that is within you. Notice where you're going to be triggered. Look to where you're going to be driven crazy. God has given us a gift. It's called Shabbat. It's called stop. And families, please hear this pastorally. We have been given this lie that says vacations will give us peace. Our vacations have become more stressful than our work week because we're told we've got to give our families and these kids these experiences or we're not good parents. Meanwhile, we come back more stressed out and even more broke, wondering why can't we hear from God? And the reason is, is because God didn't say take time to stop as a vacation. It's take time to stop and hear from me. And if you can take your kids on trips and still hear from God, you are a better man and woman than I am. Our destiny is determined by whether or not we seize the God opportunities of our lives. So here's where we dig in. Our destiny is determined by whether or not we seize the God appointed opportunities of our lives. We have to be ready. God's given us an ability to be ready for when God is walking into our lives. Be alert and ready for opportunities. The easiest and most effective way to be ready is through prayer. Prayer. There, there's, there are brain cells, a cluster of brain cells at, the brain, at, the, at, the, at our brain stem called the reticular activating system. Does anyone know this? The reticular activating system. And it creates new categories for what you identify as important. See if anyone resonates with this. A couple years ago, I bought a truck. Bless you. I bought a truck because I knew I was entering a season with my boys where they'd be moving. And I wanted a truck to help them move. And that's a nice tow package. I also got the 4x4 package. I got the 4x4 package, not because I'm going to go mudding, but because I didn't see anybody else in this community with a 4x4 truck, and I wanted to be a little different. I'm on it right here with you. Do you know what I saw when I pulled off the lot of Wade Ford? F-150, 4x4 trucks 
every direction and every area I went, they are literally all over Smyrna. Why did I start noticing them when I didn't before? Because there's this cluster of brain cells that when you think of something, when you focus on something, when you're opened up to something, your brain literally is wired to start seeing it everywhere. God has wired us that what we pray for, we will see. God has wired us that what we focus on, we will see. So please hear this pastorally. I'm I'm leaning over pastorally to say this to you. Do you see that? If you heard yourself in the beginning going, my week is jacked up, your week's going to be jacked up and you're going to see jacked up everywhere you go. If you're eaten up with stress and you're eaten up with worry, the way that our brains are wired, you're going to see stress and worry everywhere you go. The gift of of stop, of Shabbat, is not to make our week harder, but to help our brains themselves function in a way to be more healthy. Colossians 4.2, Paul says, devote yourselves to prayer and to be watchful and thankful. It's the same language as last week. Be on the lookout for the sacred. The sacred allows us the margins to be able to look for and to see what God is doing, to see the holy. Are we thankful for what God is doing and will do? Activate your RAS and look for what God is doing. In Zechariah 4.10, it says, do not despise these small beginnings for the Lord rejoices to see the work begun, to see the plumb line in Zerubbabel's hand. It literally means God takes joy in seeing the plumbing being put in. He doesn't just see the kitchen. He doesn't just see the family room. He doesn't just see the big family rooms. God loves seeing the grunt work. God loves seeing his people. God loves seeing the people of faith being focused on God and doing the hard work and doing the heavy lifting and being focused and listening to him. And almost all dreams start as a mustard seed opportunity. They almost always start with the plumbing. Be alert. The moments that seem insignificant are often the most influential. And if we don't have any margins, we will miss the divine appointment. The moments that seem insignificant are the ones that are the most influential. Our destiny, your destiny is determined by whether or not you seize the God opportunities of your lives. The health and well-being of your future, of your family. And and living into the destiny that God has for you is whether or not you're going to have the openness and you're going to have the margins to be able to hear it, to experience it. And if we don't follow the practices and patterns of God, how can we possibly discern what God is doing? Maybe when we are the busiest and the most hectic and we feel like God is nowhere near, it's because we haven't created space for him. If we don't build time into our schedules and lives to hear and know the opportunities God has prepared for us, how can we begin to grasp our individualized divine appointment and strategic placement? Send the email. Make the phone call. Invite her to lunch. Call your kid at school. Call your grandchild. Say hello. You've been thinking about it. You've been wondering about it. You've been having that voice speaking to you. Go and do it. Take that time to catch your breath. Because the genealogy of success always tracks itself back to mustard seed opportunities. And all opportunities have a shelf life. All opportunities have a shelf life. All opportunities have an expiration date. British theologian Leonard Ravenhill, one of my favorite quotes of all time, the opportunity of a lifetime must be seized in the lifetime of the opportunity. I'm gonna say that again. The opportunity of a lifetime must be seized in the lifetime of the opportunity. What opportunities has God put in front of you? Notice that I did not say, has God put opportunities in front of you? Because God has put opportunities in front of you. What Sabbath, Shabbat, and stopping does is gives us the freedom and opportunity to see the mustard seed beginnings that God has in store for us that will strengthen our faith and change our lives. It's not if, it's what. There's not a person in this room that God doesn't have a divine plan for. There's not a person in this room that God doesn't have a strategic place for you, 
that God does not need you, that God does, does not want you, the church needs you. There's, there's no one in this room that God doesn't have a blessing and a plan for. But you got to stop. You, you got to create that space and create that time where God can pour into you, where, where God can, can hold you. And do you know who's one of the worst people in the room at this concept? Staff is pointing at me in their hearts right now. I promise you they are. But one of the things that has changed over me in the, in the past year is creating these Sabbath Shabbat stop moments for me. And now we're working it into their job descriptions where they're getting away, where they're stopping, and they're going to be taking the time to hear from God. Not to not work, but to stop and be working on what God has for them. And do you know what really changed it for me? I wish I could say it was as your pastor to be a better pastor. It's not. What changed it for me was my boys are now in their 20s. And I'm watching my boys trying to learn how to be men and trying to learn how to build lives and make a living. And I really don't want them to spend their 40s the way I did, unhealthy and miserable and crazy. I don't want them to have the unhealthy habits that I have. I want them to see me and that I stop and that I ask and I listen from God. I want them to see the habit that I have, the pattern that I'm building in my own life and to know that God is measuring my steps. If you won't do it for yourself, do it for those who are watching you. If you won't build the habit for yourself, build it for those that you're teaching, that you're training, that are learning from you. Because if you want to scare me more than anything else, it's tell me that my, my kids are going to be as unhealthy as I've been in my work life. Stop. Because at the end of the day, one of the things that you've taught me together, and this is a big day, and as a preacher, you're always the preacher who came before the last preacher and before the next preacher in the Methodist church. Amen? But you have significant moments. We buried my mama together. We buried my brother together. Our youngest, our, one of our boys is going to get married next week. Life moments, significant life moments. And you find yourself looking around and going, what foundation are we lying, laying? What foundation are we building? And there's nothing more important in your week this week. There's nothing more important in your week than stopping and looking and asking. How am I hearing from God? And what am I hearing from God? As we get ready to sing this last song, and as you look at your week, as you think about what's coming, as you think about what's happened, ask yourself, did I ask God what I was doing here? Did I ask God to measure my steps? Was God in this? And as you look at your week next week, whether you do it from the pew, whether you do it from the altar, whether you do it from your car or your kitchen table when you get home, but ask yourself, am I giving this week to God and preparing myself to be where God wants me to be? And if I have to stop to do that, I'll stop. Amen.